Um, okay, so everybody, welcome to the October coffee hour. Um, October is almost over already, which is insane. We're wrapping up our collection season and moving on to, the, to seed cleaning and looking ahead to burn. So exciting time of year. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Um, we do have something to run to right after this, so we are going to end promptly in the third. So, <laughs> over the top. <laughs> All right. Uh, upcoming trainings, nothing has super changed on this. Uh, again, our next certified Lancer training is January 25th, which is a Saturday this time. Um, there's one more saw class in November. It's a level three. As far as I know, I think they're all full, but whatever reason you're looking for that, feel free to check the wait list and stuff. Um, our next coffee hour will not be in November. We're going to do it in December. Um, just I'm trying to get ahead of things. Uh, so it'll be December 12th, and we'll be back to an afternoon for that one. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and just a reminder again about the virtual and in-person sign-up. There is um, two separate ones for those, just so we know who's coming to what. Um, that's the one we have, but just nothing that. There we go. All right. Upcoming land steward work days. Uh, we have the Saturday restoration work days that I saw uh, for John work <coughs> calendar, which is awesome. Got some of those coming up here on the 26th, and then two more in November. There's ones at Lower Mud Lake for tree and brush removal. We're getting into that time of year. Uh, those will be throughout November. And then there's uh, several more Schumacher Natural Areas to work days. Um, I don't know if they're ending those at a certain time, but I only saw them going into November. So. Um, and then the Remnant Prairie Restoration Work Days at Stewart Lake are still going, and there's um, one in November and one in December. So that's what we got for the Land Steward Work Days. Um, does anyone know of any other ones that were missing? Yeah, so these are the ones that are hosted by the Land Stewards, and then ours are the staff hosted ones, but yes, still going to is the Donald uh, <coughs> motor free? <coughs> motor free at Donald? You guys are still Yes, although we do, I do now have two volunteers who are chain code certified for level one. So, what we're doing when now, when we have some things that need to come down with the chainsaw because our lockers can't handle it. At the very end of the workday, we're using the electric chainsaw. It's our first experiment, um, but giving people the opportunity to leave <laughs> if they'd rather not listen to the chainsaw. But the last time we just did it for the first time, and most people stuck around. So the, the electric chainsaw is is pretty pretty low low key. Yeah, yeah. Way, way. I mean, you, can, you can just be back feet if you don't need your protection. Yeah. And we only have you know one person doing a few things. So it's not like um yeah. like a day kind of parts birthday where you've got, you know, a dozen people with chainsaws and fresh patterns. Yeah. And it's really so that's so far so so good. Oh. And awesome. The question that popped up from that, though, so a level one certification, which is all I have, what can you not do? Like, what does level two get you? Like, what are the restrictions? There aren't like uh, hard and fast rules. Yeah, there aren't like rules like, oh, you're only level one, you can't take down a tree like this. Mm -hmm. It's just that level two and three get you more experience. How do you do the bigger trees? Yeah, there's there's um, more attention to the big trees and more challenging situations. Okay. Um, so I guess just like, added the knowledge by okay. going to those. I, I do want to eventually take an assessment. Okay. Just so I know, like, I didn't know if, like, yeah, Donald Park has. Little, little okay. Okay. We did okay. have, I guess the one that I left was the Yeah, so we don't know. I don't know. Sure. I sent you that. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Okay. And then. 
So for upcoming Zane County Parks work days, um, this is maybe a little confusing right now. So we have our final seed collection uh, tomorrow. Uh, construction ready, so still plenty of room there. People want to come out and pick seed. Um, and then seed cleaning is going to start in earnest at Libby Road starting next week. Um, and those are from 8.30 to 11.30, and then 1 to 12 to 3. Uh, and that's every day of the week from um, weekdays, I should say, not weekends, um, from the 28th till November 15th. Excluding Veterans Day, I had accidentally put once on Veterans Day. We're not allowed to work those days, so don't come on me low. Um, but that's, those aren't on the calendar now. But yeah, so we have a lot of seed cleaning coming up. We have so much seed cleaning. Happy to have everybody come out and help us clean seed. And then um, our tree and brush work days are not up on Better Impact or the calendar yet. They will be soon. We're in the process of trying to get that done. Um, and those will be starting around November 19th, and we'll be having them um, almost every Tuesday and Friday until the end of um, February, with you know a few exceptions for holidays and stuff. Um, and then we're going to start trying to have monthly women's tree and brush work days, so focusing on trying to get more women out to be comfortable using that kind of equipment. Um, and again, those are not on the calendar yet. We will be soon. Um, there is one in November, but we're trying to have more. So um, there will be more on the calendar soon. And keep an eye out for emails about burns coming up because burn season is on us. So we'll be Are you yeah. doing more autumn burns, dormant season burns? Can you use them? Yeah, so many years ago, there were no fall burns really. We were uh, trying to just focus on seed. We didn't really pass seed into to months, but um, as we build up our staffing a little bit here and um, are able to burn, we are trying to take advantage of those, those opportunities in the fall as well. Maybe not as um, committed to burning every single day like we do in the spring. I wish we could, um, but we will try to take advantage. We definitely missed a few, <laughs> very several different days. So, okay. um, but we'll be trying to squeeze some. I think we have like three in last year, um, and it helps to add you know, some boxes. Any other questions for Um, so what's right? Uh, we are coming to the end of our season, as we were saying. Things have been moving really fast. Um, there are still some goldenrods and asters that are able to be collected out there, um, as well as some of the gentians are uh, ready, ready to go right now. So we've been trying to grab some of those. So no many good populations. Yeah. Anyone know anything else? The folks that bring in seed to us. Um, Trying to get it in soon. <laughs> we are, as we talked about, switching to processing, which means we'll have less and less space for drying in the next week or so. Um, so things will continue to start trickling in towards the end of the week, but um, it's hard to continue receiving seed you know, three weeks from now as our <laughs> drying racks are being put away more and more. So if you have an urge to collect, uh, better to do it sooner rather than later before um, it's hard for us to receive that seed as we transition our facility. Anybody have any other seeds that they're trying to get out there right now? Well, I wondered if you wanted some American bitter seed. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. I've got a huge one on my property that the birds are starting to plant all over. And it is going to be. Yeah. And I don't need them all. Yeah, and there was a nice vine over at the uh, spot we saw. Uh, yeah, that yeah, was a beautiful one. Yes. I want to make sure we protect. Yeah. Um, so just bring them in when I, they're ready now. So. Yes. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Cool. 
so this is our seed timeline. Lars, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we always have questions about when we're weighing, when we're mixing, when the seeds will be ready for going out the door. And it's always kind of a lot of moving pieces. Um, here's the general timeline. Uh, we're ending our collections, as we said, at the end of this week. We'll have a few seeds trickling in. The UFS goes out with some next week. Um, but essentially, here at the end of October, uh, beginning of November is when we're done collecting. Our cleanings then go until mid-November, as we uh, showed on the workday schedule. And then um, once we have everything totally clean and final weights, Tally for every one of the 200 or so species. We will spend a few weeks, and it does take a few weeks, to create our seed mixes on paper. Um, it's a lot of mixes. It's probably close to 60 this year. 325 acres is my last tally. Um, and so we'll be working on uh, taking all of that seed. This year we have a mountain of it more than normal. And it's such a valuable asset, over a million dollars. We really try to spend a lot of time creating those um, mixes so that we're not just um, taking that million dollars and you know, willy nilly going out with it. Um, so, mid December is usually when the mixes are ready, or on paper, they're ready. And then we have our weighing days, which the volunteers are very involved in. Um, sometimes that has happened right before. The holidays, sometimes we're not quite ready. It's kind of a rush and we wait until back in the new year. Um, I wish it could happen sooner. I don't like pushing it that deep into the fall and winter, but that's just the reality of how it goes. And then soon after we mix or we weigh the seed with volunteers, we do our mixing days, which is something we started a couple of years ago. And volunteers really enjoy that, both the ones that are participating and the volunteers that are receiving the seed enjoy that we mix for them in the seed shed um, on the floor so that they don't have to do it in the field in the cold on tarps and their drives and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we take a couple of days to mix up all those 60 mixes or so. Um, and then we've been seeding them, whether it's with our broadcasting equipment on the snow and egg fields or with buckets on slopes in the woods staff or volunteers or all of us, we do all of our seeding from January through early March. Um, we don't like to go too far in the spring, and I wish it could all be seeded in the fall and early winter, but um, it just takes a while for all of that seed to get out the door. So that's kind of the general time frame. Questions on that? Um, I added a picture of Soleil because you were going to be probably interacting with her um, out in the seed shed. Uh, she's one of our newer seasonal employees. Some of you may have met her, but probably not everybody. Um, she's awesome and she's really getting to know the seed shed. Uh, we won't have very many seasonal employees left by the end of this month. Um, so she will be kind of our, our leader over there. So she's going to be in that area a lot. So. She will be very helpful. Familiarize yourself with this, Mason. <laughs> <laughs> she just graduated from UW Madison and she's already a pro at like all this stuff within a few weeks of, yeah. of doing things. So she'll probably know more than I do at the end of the <laughs> seed processing. Yeah. Uh, we, sorry, a few people were sad I mentioned this, so I'm just letting people know. We don't have Stephen anymore. Stephen was out of hours. Uh, Lydia's about to be out of hours, and uh, Susanna is now out of hours. So. A lot of our uh, more experienced crew work. For now. <laughs> okay. Cool. Oh. Cool. So this is uh, stolen from another slideshow, as you can see. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to go through the uh, processing uh, procedures, the equipment, and so forth for folks that maybe haven't been in the seed room or maybe want a refresher on how our processing um, works. And I just stole a few slides. I won't spend too much time on this, but I think it's pretty fascinating. Um, and 
if you haven't been there before, come and join us. Uh, this is our hammer mill. So after this is their dried, uh, which we do on bands on the racks, um, we take them and process them through this machine. That cylinder spins and all those little metal hammers um, spin around really fast. And then you've got a screen there and various screen sizes you can insert that um, prevent the seed from passing beyond the hammers. Uh, they're a smaller screen. It'll keep them there next to the hammers a lot longer and pulverize that seed quite a bit smaller. If it's a bigger mesh, it'll let that seed pass in much quicker size and those hammers all they're doing is they're breaking up the seed outside of their capsules outside of the seed heads getting them so they're not any longer attached to anything pretty much it's a big wood chipper that you're just throwing this stuff through and passing up and mulching it into one big um, mix stems chaff seed and everything after it goes through this hammer mill, we'll go to the next slide. Here's what it looks like. So on the left, that's some soft stem bulrush, right in the field, dry, and then it passes through, and it looks like a big tub of mulch. See, and all. After that, it goes onto these fanning mills. These particular machines are probably 100 years old. They're repurposed from Know, folks that used to operate them with a hand crank, now they have an electric motor, um, they're made out of wood, um, they still work, um, they just have different screen sizes than the old agricultural screens that were more for big seated um, oats and such. We have little screens and pass the seed mulch mixture on top of these and through these machines to separate the seed from the chaff. That way we can get a more accurate weight on the seed and um, reduce the volume of the seed that we're storing, weighing out, and then ultimately mixing. And give you a little bit of space for storage. Here's a, kind of a close up. We've got a top screen, which is really a smaller mesh, and then a bottom screen, sorry, a larger mesh, and then a bottom screen, which is more of a fine mesh. Shapes. And rattles and the seed, roll, seed rolls across the top. Top screen filters off the big chaff. The seed passes through and lands on the bottom screen. The bottom screen is fine enough that it prevents the seed from passing, but it lets the dust through. And then right away, with just those two screens, you have separated off all the big chaff and all of the dust of small chaff, and all you have left is the seed and everything about the same size as the seed. At that point, it falls in front of a turning fan and you can adjust the fan force or speed of that fan to um, blow away the chaff from the seed as the final step. And that um, chaff is usually lighter, the seed is usually heavier. So you've got to dial in that fan at about the right force, but you're blowing away the shaft and maybe even some of the duds, the seeds that you want to pollinate correctly. It goes a bit lighter. And then the heavier seed drops to the bottom. So you take that mulch on the left from the hammer mill, pass it to the fan mill, and on the right is a close up of the fine, um, concentrated seed. Final product we have at the end. Might be the last slide, maybe one more. Oh, there we go on to weighing. <laughs> I love that picture of Dennis. <laughs> um, and so after we've got our pure seed, we get our total weights and we create our seed mixes um, on the computer. And then we have you all. Um, on tables with a box of whatever you have in front of them, rose seed or something. Um, and then he's weighing them out according to the seed mix uh, pick list and putting them in plastic bags of labels, nice and neat, all going to one spot. And then I think we'll have one more slide for the mixing process, which we take all that seed, dump it back all together, 
This is the first time the species have met each other. <laughs> Up until this point, they've all stayed separate. Um, now we're making a little um, spice mix in that swimming pool there, and then mixing it back. Frustrating how it mixes back with the chaff that we spent so much time separating on. <laughs> but we mix it back in with the chaff um, and save the only the finest cuts of chaff <laughs> for this mixing with the seed. We get rid of all the twiggy stuff, the big stuff that'll clog up our machinery, that'll poke people in the hands, get rid of all the dust that'll fly in your faces and your eyes and your nose when you're when you're seeing um, you'll know, just have that medium-sized chaff mixed with the seed. That creates volume. Um, it's uh, really hard to seed these prairie plants. If you just have pure seed, it's like you know hundreds, Ten, thousands, tens of thousands, <laughs> tens of thousands of seeds in one little palm pool. That's very hard to meter out of our big area. So we dilute it. Um, so what, is, what is generally the ratio of dilution? It just depends on the seed type of seed. We usually use about one trash bag, like you know, forty gallon trash bag per. It's about five acres with our machinery, okay. and then maybe a little bit more diluted than that for hand run. Yeah. Okay. Even more. Yep. So one of the things that I learned along the way, I mean, if you got some really a special place that you got to work on, it's small. You know, you can't do the big machinery thing, and you're trying to take out grasses or whatever, some other kind of cool weather grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the, the the thing that I learned along the way is you can use uh, the uh, sawdust from you know gerbils and stuff like that. You can mix that like four or five to one, just wet and put it in there and wet it with your really fine seeds. And that'll give you a, a hand throw. You know, if you can do twenty five square feet, you get thirty to sixty seeds per foot square foot. Yeah. With the really the small stuff. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah, of the yeah. Like dust on yeah, it's like dust. Yes, exactly. When you have pest, yeah, pest is good. When you have it down to it, it's practically dust. You can't you can't hand spread it and get any distance. So what you want is surface tension <clears throat> with water, and then that gives you, you you can you can get it out and then it spreads itself and sticks sticks to the Sawdust or chip. So that works for small stuff. It's really nice. Keeps the dust down. Oh, God, keeps the dust down. But it really, what it does is it gets the really, you don't throw 10,000 seeds in one spot. Yeah. Right. I don't know. And I've, I've talked with woodworkers that I know about like collecting their sawdust, but then they raised the issue that I need to think about. He's like, well, I work with a lot of walnuts. Okay. Then generally, you do not want to use walnut dust, right? No, no okay. walnut. Okay. That'll kill anything. <laughs> oh, walnut. That. Walnut. You you just cut a walnut tree down and you put the sawdust right on your lawn. Yeah. It'll, it'll kill everything. <laughs> okay. And walnut go against tomatoes. I mean, walnut stuff is just. Yeah. Just spreading that on my lawn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake years ago. I learned that. You know. Oh, okay. interesting. Yeah. I have a question. When you get those big bags full of chaff and seed, does the, does the seed tend to settle to the bottom very much? And how important is it to yeah, get it? Okay, we're going to try to yeah, it, it do with another mix. does a little bit. And I used to get really worked up about that. <laughs> and uh, But now I, I kind of like the uneven distribution <laughs> of uh, taking a species and maybe. Some of them drop out sooner and they're more clumped in one part of your field versus bigger seeded species you can stay in the mix a little longer. Some people really want it to be even distribution and they'll have a fine seeded seed mix and then they'll do a separate large seeded seed mix and then they'll get a really nice distribution by going twice over their, yeah. their site. And I just we, even in the past, um, Wayne especially was very um, coming all about not even mixing the seeds together and not trying to uniformly spread them across his field. He would give you a bag of a species and you would only have that species and you wouldn't have it delivered. And you'd go and you'd kind of go around and walk 
stripes and lines and circles all around the field. And then the next person would hit the next species and do the same thing. And they would follow the same path. They would all kind of make big squiggly lines all over the place with every single species seen separate. And then there's a very clumpy streaky pattern to the prairie that maybe is a little bit more resembling to the natural prairie where species are clumped more instead of a perfectly even distribution across the whole site, which is a little unnatural. Um, and these prairies look great and they worked out and they are really nice collection spots because the, the species are clumped. And still flat to this day, but you can, you can see even many, many years later, the, the line that people walked, which is kind of fun. Is the county equipment, which usually equipment though, does it have a, is it like a drum thing that spins and it kind of constantly mixes in yes. those? Yeah, so, so and probably, so the, probably the smaller seed might settle to the bottom. Yeah. But when we're doing our big 40 acre or more than that, even sometimes fields, we don't have just one bag where the fine seed settles down and then comes out in the first five acres. We've got 10 bags, 20 bags. Yeah. So you get at the beginning of every new bag, maybe some of that fine seed will settle out. Right, I guess at first, but then 20 feet over, you start a new bag, and then 20 feet from there, you start a new bag. So it might be a little bit more streaky and not quite as perfectly distributed. But when you look from a bird's eye view, it's fairly. I know when we talked with Shane a little bit about the milkweed project, he said something about milkweed, the butterflies see the milkweed in a particular area as one plant. Yeah. Can you say more about that? And what does that mean for how we should distribute, like maybe the milkweed that we have in our in our parks if we're doing some work with school kids or whatever? Like, should you, should you put a variety of milkweeds in one spot <laughs> or should you put um common milkweed concentrated in a small area here and then over here and over here and then your butterfly milkweed mm -hmm. you know what what does yeah. what does what you learned from the if it was the monarch people or whoever yeah. what does that mean for our process well, that was something i had never heard before but um, he said it on a seminar from uh some monarch experts and the um, takeaway was that there's more value for the monarchs when the milkweed um, to, to, to the passing butterfly uh, the milkweed populations seem to be blocked up and separate rather than continuous even across the site and they looked at those evenly distributed populations of milkweed as kind of like one spot Whereas if there was separation between those patches of milkweed, um, they kind of looked at that as multiple sites or opportunities. And I don't really know if we fully understand that biology of the monarch yet. Um, and in some cases, you know, I'm not so sure it's worth you know, contorting our Practice. practices sure. to accommodate that at this point, but okay. maybe getting too deep into the intricacies and the weeds of things. Right. So the more, the most important thing is just getting that seed out of the ground, more so than agonizing over like the patterns of how okay. you're distributing them and all that kind of thing. I think you could probably lose a lot of sleep over that stuff and just sort of let nature take its course okay. <laughs> and move on to killing more bugs. <laughs> those are, that's the host plant, right? It's not the yeah. larval host. It's not as if there, something next to yeah. So it sure seems like with nectar plants, they like to, they all like to go to the same area. Mm -hmm. But it's just maybe when it comes to the larval stage, yeah, they, yeah, depositing the rates. Okay. Well, maybe, yeah. Well, this might be related. I was involved in the monarch larval monitoring project. And and I've done a lot of reading about garden, you know, home gardens and monarchs. And with, with home gardens, they're saying, you know, it works to have 
your patch in your garden and your neighbor having a patch in his or her garden. That monarchs don't need a field of solid milkweed in order to, to go there. And you'll even see milkweed moving around bit by bit. So it doesn't always just stay there. So that I think that sounds similar to mm -hmm. what Shane was, was hearing. That you don't have to, to plant a field of milkweed to attract monarchs. Having patches here and there is yeah, sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that we can talk about maybe at the volunteer summit if, or invite the people from that, whoever it is that. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a, a good topic idea. nowadays. And if we get this big grant, it will be a bigger topic for us. <laughs> yeah. Trying yeah. to get a modern parliament. Yeah, we have to make sense that you know, you've got various milkweed seeds you just you can scatter them. You don't know like the individual soil conditions of this quarter acre, this and so whatever you know, whichever conditions are just right for whichever species and try to pick ahead of time about which right. Yeah. There's this butterfly here that you know, yeah. It seems like we're agonizing maybe too much and scatter it and see what comes up. That, that, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, well, we can talk about seeds all day, but we'll move on here to uh, fall brush work. Can you guys see this okay? Do you want me to turn off some of the lights? It's a little bright. Yeah, I think some of I might be looking from the window too. You know, oh, that's that true. Those are two spots. That's that's in my it's two spots. There. Oh, that was very that's very good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. People still doesn't look still doesn't look green to me. <laughs> um, okay, so should we line up the slide? I can kick us off. Sure. Go I'll for take basil sure. and start a poll here. Okay. <laughs> so this as we transition our, our work is very seasonal at course as we transition away from seeds. Um, it is becoming a more prime time of year for brush work. Cooler temperatures, easier for me to wear traps. I know that. Easier for me to focus on brush when there's not seeds and other things to worry about. Um, this is kind of a transitionary period where we're kind of on the cusp of two seasons, and foliar treatment is coming more towards an end. If you are doing your foliar applications, you really want to make sure you're applying to healthy green foliage as we get these frost days as you know the colors are changing yeah the buckthorn and the honeysuckle and the invasives will retain their green leaves longer but make sure you're applying the good healthy foliage and they haven't you know, been too um, impacted by the seasons by the deep cropping yeah so leaves are turning or, or curling like there's there's not going to be good uptake anymore it's your uptake's in a slow decline. So your return on investment is you know, less and less. Um, you may want to transition to cut and treat or um, basil at this point, and they stick out very well as the um, oak leaves are gone, the trees will lose their leaves and into November. Um, even if they're not taking in herbicide, uh, the buckthorn leaves will still be on the stems and they're very easy to find and locate that way um, compared to a few weeks from now when no leaves are on. And so it's a great time to start. We just had a lot of basil and cut stuff experience. Mm -hmm. they on um, that approach. Yeah, so I have done a lot of work with um, basil barking, uh, mostly honeysuckles were my experience, but it applies to buckthorn as well. Um, so for those who may not be super familiar, basil bark method is using an oil-based um, garlon four, and that is in a backpack sprayer, generally a lid can use a hand sprayer as well. 
And um, essentially what you're doing is just spraying um, a full like 360 coverage of every stem, kind of like you're seeing the picture on the right here. I usually do it pretty low to the ground. Um, and you want to make sure you're getting all the way around every single stem. It's really important you don't miss one because if you miss one on a multi-branched plant, that section might survive. Um, and that. Oh, you want it to be a fairly wide band. So the smaller it is, the less it matters, but the larger the um, shrub or tree, or you can do it on trees as well. The larger it becomes, the wider do you want that band. So, so back to diet. I, this has got a good question. Diameter ratio of the let's call it the, let's call it the woody stem mm -hmm. versus the band width. I don't have a specific number, no, but, that's good. No, <laughs> but that's good. it does increase for sure. Like if I I've done it on cherry trees that were only like this large, um, and I would still put like a foot foot and a half there yeah. around it, and it was successful. But uh, it does have to be wider for those larger. Yeah, that's 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 what I, it's. You got to be at least as wide as the diameter. Yes. How's that? So. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good a good measurement for it. Um, Is it a different concentration than cut stump? I'm not sure what we use for cut stump. It can be. Ours is twenty percent. Yeah, that's typically about what it is. Um, twenty percent. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, you can do it these things tend to come pre-mixed is how people will buy them. So um, it comes just as this oil-based herbicide that already has the dye and the oil and the herbicide in it. Um, so it's um, triclopyr is the active ingredient in Garland and it comes at about 20%. I'm well, fascinated that you see particularly in depth with honey stuff because they can be so spray like, yes. and there's so many stems like but it's yeah. high quality in there <laughs> it's just easier if i have a saw with it just cut it off like and just stump yes, tree, right? but then you have to find every single stem to yeah paint as well, well if, they're, so, if they're really tiny yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking like these ones that are huge bushes and it's like multiple stumps of this mm -hmm. uh, okay. yeah it's i mean it, you can do either um i have found it really useful because um, I've worked in situations where it was just not as efficient to go through with a saw and have someone sawing and sawing and sawing and someone having to follow behind them and find every single little stump of that right. yeah. individual and paint it. Um, it's also good for people who maybe don't want to use a saw or are experienced with that kind of tool. Um, it is very effective. There has been anecdotal evidence <laughs> in the past that uh, basil bark was kind of hit or miss, or you had to do a certain time of year. Um, there have been multiple science-based studies on it. I have done one of them. Uh, it is extremely successful in every season. I don't recommend doing it in the height of summer. Um, Triclopyr is recommended not to be used uh, over, I think, 70 degrees. Also, just an unnecessary and unpleasant time to do it. <laughs> but you can do this in the middle of January, and it will still be effective. Um, one thing to be aware of is that there is this delay. So um, this first picture here is six months after basal bark treatment. Uh, I believe this was one that was treated in the winter. And so it still leaked out in the spring. And so you think like, oh no, it failed. But just wait, <laughs> it will work. Um, that 12 months later, that individual was completely dead. Um, so it can take this delayed period to see success, but uh, it is very effective. And it doesn't have too much overspray versus doing a foliar treatment. Um, so if you're kind of in an area that maybe has some nice woodland plants in the understory, um, it can be a great kind of in between where if you don't have the time and energy to cut and treat, but you don't want to foliar spray and have this huge overspray, um, it is a much, much smaller um, band of off target. You'll get a little bit of sterilization. Yes, the base. Mm -hmm. you will get a little. Um, there was a study done by a friend of mine a few years ago, um, his master's thesis, that found it was like, I think like six to ten inches was the overspray typically. And it did fill back in within a year um, with similar species that were produced in there. Um, but yeah, it will have a little bit. So if you just had a couple of you know, buckthorn spread out in a really sensitive area and you didn't want to kill anything, maybe you would go to the tree again. Um, but it's, it's a pretty small amount of off target. How about as far as your application method, what do you want to do with like the pressure? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm typically having like the nozzle of my um, my wand for my backpack like right against the stem. And I'll kind of do like one of these and go around um, all sides of the shrub so that you're getting it around each stem. And then sometimes you're kind of sticking it in the middle. But I usually have the pressure pretty low so you're not like spraying out all over the place. It's just dribbling directly onto the stem. You mentioned being patient, like the six months later, it's still green. Is that true with foliar too? Like, yeah, sometimes we go back and gee, I wonder how, how dead it looks. And you see some look really dead, and others like, well, it's still got a clump of green going up here. Yeah, I don't have any personal evidence of that. Um, it might be true in some cases, but, but I'm not aware of that being as predominant. I think Maybe usually foliar is a bit faster. Wait a year. Yeah. I would say foliar is faster. Bit faster. Uh, you're not seeing that like the it was. I've never, you know, we're always running around doing so much. I've never flagged off some of these little <clears throat> things and like made a mental note to come back and check. It's like a little, little trial test situation. I've we're always trying to do too much and we often don't pause and kind of look at things a little more closely like that. So if you're ever motivated to uh, think about you know, coming back and checking on some of your sites for a follow-up, that would be interesting to know. And with the basal bark, these are ones where we were specifically tagging every single individual so we were able to track for sure whether, whether they were dying or not. And we had controls making sure that they weren't just randomly dying for some other reason. So. Yeah, I asked you about this other method. So, like in those pictures on the left, you can see like behind it, a lot of small stems. Like I have, if I have areas that are acres, basically really thick, small stem, newish growth. It's like five feet tall. It could even be hard to get into all of it. And then, if it, and so what? I mean, I think I'm just gonna come with a brush cutter, just just mow down. But then wait until it's flush, maybe in the spring, and then pull your spring when it's this tall. I mean, that works. Yeah, we do that too. Okay. Um, Not even worry because I could rush cut them out and try to come with a wand, but even that would be so tedious to, to wand every tip of the stump yeah. with it. And so I know some people will try to hit the stumps after the brush cut and then will um, come back and get whatever's left, but I've also seen people who will go through and brush no the larger machines mm -hmm. and then come through the backpack and retreat fully or treating that later. Yeah. Um, okay. So in that case, I think it's kind of a View of whatever's fastest because you have probably nothing else growing there. I'm assuming. Right, that, yeah, if I'm doing, yeah, I'm not blanking. So you're not really worried about it. It's all bucks over there. Okay. Yeah. What about seed formation in that second year? Or so you, you go after the. Yeah. Having seed form after spraying it yeah. before it dies. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen any specific studies tracking that. In my experience, um, when it has been sprayed, at least for our studies, there was no seed set afterwards. Okay. Um, but the majority of that was being sprayed. Um, we did. There was fall there, like it was like December, March, and then some May. And I don't know whether anyone tracked if the ones in May went to seed, but I don't believe that they did. Um, they were green, and then by the fall, those ones died quicker. It was by like fall, they were brown, and I don't believe that they went to flower or to seed. Yeah, and then for the ones that you're spraying in fall or spraying in the winter, they'll like leap out spraying and die when you even get to the flower. Um, but great question. I would like to see someone specifically do that as well because it's possible if you hit it just the right time to do it. What do you do with the dead stems that are there? Yeah, um, at least the places where I've done it. So um, these were areas where it was pretty thick and we would leave the stems, and then as leaf litter accumulated from the forest over time, they would be burned, and those dead stems burn up pretty quickly compared to the living plant. Um, so eventually they would not be visible anymore. But yeah, I think that's another reason people really like cut trees, is that you get to see, like, 
Ah, oh, it's gone. It's done. Yeah. Uh, which I agree. It's very visually satisfying. Um, and this is just another uh, useful method if you are struggling with, you know, another way of doing it or finding out time or whatever. Um, just variety. So another another way to learn about it and works any time of year, which is probably the most useful part. That would be the idea of it in scenarios where it's not thicker than you know, air. Yeah. You know, it's scattered and you kill it and then it doesn't spread more than it already is. Yeah. Um, and then if it dies in place, there's not so much dead wood in that spot that it's uh, going to have all this debris around. But say that's a Ideal scenario for this method, or just even thicker areas of those would work well as well? I have used it in really dense areas. Um, um, just you can because. Get all those little yeah, yeah, or I've used it in areas where it was dense with mature um, yeah. high level. So you had a lot of large stem cells, okay. and it had not previously been treated in any other way. Mm -hmm. And so this was sort of like the first initial, and we're talking <laughs> some where it's like thin enough you couldn't swing a brush mortar easily or yeah, yeah, brush yeah. Yeah. Um, And you know, it was a site where it wasn't a brush mortar available, and having like a big machine and mowing all down and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it can be used in a diversity of situations. I would say if you had like a million stems the size of your thumb. I probably would bother with it, but I think it's nice for that in between of like, well, we aren't able to mow this down and we've got these large individuals that we can spray and we don't want it to be something we can do whenever and people can do it without training of saws. Yeah. Um, and we're not going to therefore kill anything that you maybe have in a understory that has a little bit. Okay, yeah, but uh, yeah, especially with the body stuff that's mature, but I can see that the stems are. Numerous and tough to get. Mm -hmm. What I did at our land was just the bigger trees like buckthorn and stuff. Um, instead of basil spraying and grew them, and then used a lot less spray. It's the same concentration, 20. Uh, our land, we just do the two basil rings, yeah. and then that could just use a little hand saw or a little steel hand that Again, it works. Some of them six months later, some of them leaves, but then 12 months later. Yeah, and we'll, uh, I will this little bird will are very effective. Um, I personally think it's a lot faster to base a market with spray Probably. rather than yeah. using yeah. a saw. Because <laughs> uh, I mean, I can get all the way around, you know, yeah. any side all of my side side side. Side. <laughs> Yeah, 10, 20 seconds. Also, when you, things like honeysuckle, which has a lot of stems, and even in other willows, all kinds of, if you're trying to go in with a chainsaw and you, yeah, you're, you're working with that, you're going to lose your <laughs> chain no matter what you do and how yeah. tight you make it. Yeah. So they fall, they trip, they slide. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Spend more time putting your saw back together. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of pros and cons to every method. Um, and the site is very expensive. Uh, uh, there are some things that are you know, it and you can't treat it or you don't pull your treat, just another way to get rid of it. Any way that you can kill a fresh Whatever works for you. Is that is there a solution that works for an aquatic certified apple? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think, think so. Basil bark in the there's areas. no, I don't think there's a real true basil bark treatment for. Not that I'm aware of. In a aquatic Yeah. When you said willow, I thought. That's where, I mean, that's another, that's another <laughs> yes, topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. could, maybe if it was like too expensive, you know, but no, I don't sure. think you should, yeah, use it over to Yeah, no. not in our, our wetlands. Never. It's that's another old topic. I thought you were going to get that the brush cut or cut stuff treatment or not. Okay. For so, so back to treatment, even in the basal bark, is there any good research on what stem size? Maybe it's uh, not oil based but water based. Is there a stem size limit 
this is not going to pick it up. I've we, I've done some other, you know, what is it? Uh, I can't remember. On buckthorn in the winter, and like putting stuff that's all coming back, or sumac, even in the fall. You know, it's like I thought I got rid of all that. Here it is again. Are you talking for stump treatment? Or yeah, stump treatment. Okay. And, and the, is that coming up in the talk or? Not specifically. Off the well, anyway, so right? stump treatment. Yeah. I heard. I heard <laughs> when you get these twigs, if you're getting under three eighths of an inch, oh, forget it. You're just you're killing your you're, you're dobbing, you know. Buckthorn blasters all over little three eighths and stuff, and nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You said it doesn't take it up. It doesn't. It, the root, the ratio of the take up to the root is not good. It's not. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's, like it's, it's a ratio of the side of the plant mm -hmm. to the stem to the root, and you can't take it. It won't take it up. That's what I heard. Once once you're under a quarter. Yeah, I'm not sure like that, but. I mean, I know there's certain vegetations where you're frustrated with things like that. So yeah, I I tried looking it up, and I noticed, but I I assumed maybe wrongfully that it was because I didn't see the stems, and that's why it didn't die because they never got treated. But maybe they did get treated, and they just didn't have enough time. I do also think sometimes when people are um, like dabbing on, sometimes they're not dabbing enough. Mm -hmm. I usually feel pretty heavy when you know, herbicide yeah. don't go on stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's I mean that's I don't have any specific evidence around that. So All right, but back to your question about little being careful here about mm -hmm. this is, we're talking about basal bark, which is an oil based. There are herbicides that are for, that are water based, and it's one of the commercial name is Aquadine. You got to be really, really, really certified and very, 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 very careful if you got any kind of water, any kind of moisture on this soil, and because it breaks a whole new set of rules, you can't right. in applying it. So you, you you don't want overspray. You don't want any of that other stuff. So yeah, yeah, aquatics is a more of their least unfortunate. But uh, yeah, I don't know of any of any basal working method that is certified over. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're going to go next. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, do you have a bunch of relatively small plants in brush bed, and they or may not get all of the stumps, and then you want to come back in the spring to foliar? And you regrowth. Um, if that was an area that you could uh, broadcast seed out, is that foliar going to kill those seeds? Um, if they are uh, broadly, yes. Okay. But if you can, but, but will be most of the honeysuckle and the buckthorn leak out first before those seeds germinate? Or if you can get it early enough? Um, it them? does leak out very early. Yes, germination versus when they're actually coming up. I don't yeah, know. plus, you know, if you're waiting on a cut from to leaf out, it's only, that's what you're talking about, a scenario where you didn't treat it correctly. And it's going to take or until, just missed it. It's going to take until July for that cut and stump to put on enough stem, uh, stems and leaves to be able to take in enough herbicide. Okay. That's not going to happen really this spring. Well, I'm going to say you, oh, you oh. could also label bark in that scenario if you, you know, could see yeah. that things were re sprouting, but it was not, <clears throat> not really to be worth it, or you were like, oh, should I put down seed and now I don't want to spray onto it? You could basically bark those too, as long as they're, you know, big enough that you can spray around them and, and actually see the stem. Yeah. You can use the basic bark on it. So, okay. that's also possible. So, back to a, 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 a real Forestry more, you know, just shear the freaking daylight out. Yes. You know, and you got mulch, you got stems, mm -hmm. you got snared, all kinds of stuff. You can can you basal bark that kind of carefully? I you use could. the word carefully. I still wouldn't do it until it's grown up enough that you can see it through the mulch. Oh, okay. Because in that situation, yeah, you where, too much junk. Yeah, all if right. you're coming through with a forestry mower, that's a whole other situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. that's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, you you cannot. Usually, see you, you can't find it. You can't that. find it. No, yeah, right. that's 
something where I would wait like six months to a year. Yeah, these are the big ones. Yeah, but, I mean, that's usually. Yeah, yeah. But, so, some of the big ones. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to come back for the ones. All right. Well, that's <laughs> what I was. That's but right, yeah, though. and that one you could, you could space them when they grow back. Yeah, when they, could, come, when they come back, when they come back, then you know what you got. Okay. So, what mix you're intending for long time? Oh, we got to yes. talk. Yeah, <laughs> we got to talk with you soon. That, that's your, your scenario there of um, spraying while things are germinating. The reason we put down the grasses first, we don't want to give the grasses a head start over the forbs, and we prefer to have them all together. But the grasses are going to tolerate our foliar moving spray. Okay. While you're still getting control of the Okay. Maybe things more for some Yeah, yeah. Good discussion here. In addition to um, accessories. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's accessory. I heard uh, Sumac can come up here recently in the discussion, and Liz and uh, Wendy here have some great experience with Sumac control at Don. So I'll turn over to you guys. You can call anything with sumac is great. <laughs> but um, we started talking about sumac at the last coffee hour. Mm -hmm. it? How frustrating it is to deal with because of re sprouting. And we have an area in Donald Park that we've been working on for a few years. And I had some photos that I sent to Lars. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought it might be helpful to walk you through what we did. Yeah. And because we're feeling kind of positive about that that area now. Um, the this is a, a knoll. So you're looking at the north slope. So there's sumac and on the north slope and all the way around on the east side and up on top as well. And Dane County Park staff did the first attack on it in January of 2022 with brush cutters and brush haul, you know, the whole chainsaw. thing. Yeah, chainsaws, everything. Um, and that was just when I started as a land steward. So I went back there in August of 2022, and it was wall to wall sumac and it just re-sprouted I think on the, the upper right you could see how dense the sumac was so that was at just after the big thing kind of parks thing so anyway so we went after it in November of 2022 I had Three work days there. Ours are two out two hour work days. Um, a group of six, a group of four, a group of three. So twenty six volunteer hours in November of twenty twenty two. Now, unfortunately, I didn't take a photo when I went back in the fall of twenty twenty three. I had, but I had two work days then in September of. 2023, eight volunteers, five volunteers. So that was another 26 volunteer hours in that area. But then came back September of 2024, and before we worked on it, I took that photo on the bottom. Now you can see that red sumac sort of right in the middle there, but you don't see many more. So by September 2024, that that area then once been completely covered with sumac was to our eyes looking pretty manageable. Um, and and I, I will say when I saw that August 2022 scenario, I said, did say to Lars, can't you just like spray the whole thing? And he took a look, and mm. you saw good stuff coming in. Yes, so that meant we had to do it manually. So we used loppers and the garlon for um, every stem, every sumac stem. So um, this year, 
then after, after that September 2024, we went back, um, went up there. We basically had one more thing with five volunteers. Although I had come in twice before myself to take out sumac and brambles in an area that would be the worst area for volunteers to work in. So, so I went in and took that out myself with volunteers down in addition to being unpleasant to put them in. So I just did two two hour um, episodes on my own and then we had five volunteers. So that was like 14 volunteer hours this year. So come next year, we're pretty excited. And then, I mean, we really got, we felt, we crawled all over that place this year. And, and we really felt we got everything we could see. Um, so we're, we're kind of hopeful. What replaced it? It looks like there's what uh, it? Yeah. There's a lot of aspen coming in. Uh, aside so, from the if it's not one thing, it's another. <laughs> <laughs> but this, what I wanted to ask, getting into that, what came in, um, was, I, that was before I was a volunteer. Mm -hmm. Was that planted after you treated the sumac, or was this natural stuff that came up once it was being Yeah, planted? it was a planted prairie many, many years ago that got oh, okay. brushed over. Because there's a lot of, there's northern bedscow in there, spider wort. Uh, some really nice stuff. Yeah. Um, well, that, so that's we, encouraging. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't want to obviously kill all those good things that had been planted and survived all those years. And we had been planted during the, all of this. Um, this was just cutting and cutting the tree. In a in a, in a difficult slope because that first. Uh, they kind of part today in January 2022. There was about six inches, six to eight inches of snow on the ground. So that left a lot of stumps, which we tripped over so every other yeah. day. Yeah. Uh, those things. And when we, they're starting to run off, we can kick them out now. Yeah. But the, the part that's important is with their brush mower with what mechanical or uh, I'm going to use the word gasoline powered rotary blade. No, not we use the cut and trim. You had it on January 2022. The first initial. Yes, you had it. They were, they were brush cutters, but yeah. then the and small brush up. cutters. Well, mostly in this area, it was brush cutters because I was one of the herbicide yeah. people. Oh, it was, was coming it was, in after this. And, and tree. It was yeah. brush and tree. It, Got it was it. a brush cutter and then try as best you can. Yeah, I understand that part. But that's yeah. what I was me me mechanically. The first was gasoline powered or whatever. Yes. Uh, yes. With saws or, and brush cutters. Both treated. Then you could come back only with floppers, basically. No more mechanical. Requirements. Right. Right. I guess what this engine assist. Right. Totally quiet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except for the conversation mm -hmm. okay. and the moaning. Well, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, <laughs> but, and I, I understand the, the snow mm -hmm. issue that gets be difficult when you're doing a certain lot of other things. You, yeah. you start you start cutting into snow and rock depending on your terrain. Mm -hmm. You around here you can be shamed, you can be hitting rocks and everything else. So. Mm -hmm. It was also hard to see. Yeah. You know, I, I was on that January, I'm following a brush cutter, yep. but it, sometimes it, the stem is disappearing in the snow. Mm -hmm. So that probably also contributed yeah. to how dense you see on the upper. But it does take, but the part that's encouraging is after a couple of rounds you, you, yeah. of treatments, after you mechanically get the volume down. It's managed. It, it so far seemed seemed to be like I said the one on the bottom. That's before we did any work this this fall, and so, um, and with the 
Two and five and a couple of hours. And that, and that, one of the things about sumac is that the clones you call out, it, it really mm -hmm. generates with these runners. Yes. That's maybe a bad term. I don't know. Yeah. They're especially bad the second year because then you feel like you've gone in there and struggled and filled with yeah. good stuff, and then it all comes back and smaller and harder to get at. It's annoying, and, which I'm facing on my own property. I go side. And then um, because it loses persistence it is, and insistence that we go back to that site. Over and over. Three years. So it made a difference. Three, right? three shots in. So this was was um, Bay County Parks once, us twice, 22 and 23. I don't have a photo of it. And we did go back yeah. later okay. in September of 2024 after that. All right. was, was taken. What was this lower image? That was after you guys had two treatments. And yes, the lower one happen. is after we did two treatments yeah. and before we did the third. Yeah. This year. Yeah. So. Two treatments really get you, get you ninety percent there. Plus we got some walnut satin and some other stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, we have well, to go back. Sun, to sunshine, so. sunshine makes things grow. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I, but I, Wendy knows. I would just, I did say to people, go after the sumac. Mm -hmm. Just today, just yes. the sumac, and we'll, you know, we'll come back for the honeysuckle because there was some. Uh, yeah, but for if I had a crew of volunteers, I just wanted them going after one thing. Mm -hmm. okay. I would and I would agree with that. You get people get oh oh I'll get this over here. No, no, you have to get the suit back today. And we'll get the other Stop technique. Stop looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> now in another area, this is the Bay County Park Center. This is where we in another area I have used a basal bar treatment. Um, up on the top of that Oak Savannah Ridge, when I first saw the sumac up there, I contacted um, Kathy Brock, mm -hmm. uh, with Pleasant Valley Conservancy, State Natural Area, and asked Kathy what to do. And they used the basal bar treatment that I then, when I was up there by myself one day, did and it seemed to work, but her method is you grab the stem, you pull it back a little, a little bit, and I'm using the, the herbicide sticks from um, CBE that we bought. You just get at the very bottom and swipe up about a foot. One side. On one side. On one side. Yeah. In fact, they found that to be really effective. And in that area that I tried it, it did, did seem to, to work pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you know, we got to go back. So, yeah. So for one person working alone, and I used it yesterday in the, as well, because I was alone in a prairie area, it goes fairly quickly rather than you know, getting down on your hands and knees, yeah. cutting it with a lock or dabbing it with a buckthorn blaster. Mm -hmm. But I have, I have heard of that swiping method. Yeah. She uses, she, they, they would just take a, um, like a sponge, a paint sponge, and duct tape it to a stick, carry a spray bottle with herbicide, periodically spray the sponge, and then, and then swipe it up. We do so, have um, a comment from one of our uh, Zoom participants here who said, um, quoting from Tom Brock, to eradicate and sumac clone, the single treatment of herbicide is not enough, or the above ground shoot stimulates root sucker formation. These new shoots must be killed if the clone is to be eradicated. It's necessary to canvas the tree to form with a few feet and a few beats, go through the shoots, spray them with the layer spray, repeat again. Again, mm -hmm. and return the following year, spraying your shoots or repeat a third year. Right. Now, mm -hmm. each year there should be fewer root suckers. So I think that's similar to what you guys are seeing, although it kind yeah. of maybe didn't make quite as many treatments for it. Well, I, I, yeah, I couldn't get back and do the foliar, the foliar treatment. Um, it was just too many other stuff, mm -hmm. stuff around. So I doing the repeated swipes one year after the other. Yeah. Like and the other tip that Kathy gave me is to do it this time of year when the leaves are red. 
because right. you can you can find it. Yeah. And you can see some of the small stuff too that you normally wouldn't be able right. to. Because it's right there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so that's another thing that's for us. Persistence. Yeah. 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 And insistence. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing um, just to tie together past uh, with basal bark, we learned that cutting and treating aspen was not very successful, but basal bark and aspen was very successful. Um, same with uh, black locus sometimes. I think the cutting action um, triggers it to sprout, whereas if you basal it, it's a little less so the triggering <laughs> um, thing. Uh, Fuller's brain works well for aspen and black locus. Uh, but if you're in the uh, cut and treat mode, maybe do a basil instead of a cut and treat. Yeah, we're yeah, holding on on that. We're gonna have to learn how to use this thing. Yeah. Yeah, aspen is very, very fungal, and that 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 oil based herbicide really affects the things that we Okay, I guess for what people less familiar with using sprayers and some of this equipment. You can picture at a landscaping session because we need to get some more new landscapes. We have a few photos of some of the equipment you typically use with that um, volunteers with landscapes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we've, we've also done, um, talked about doing like, a, like some hands on sessions. Oh, yeah. That's helpful to some folks. Yeah. Give you yeah. a different sort of um, uh, uh, a calc hour. Maybe we don't do a whole lot of. Slides and just do some hands on workshop. Yeah, workshop. Thanks a lot. Um, we've got only about 15 minutes left here, so we'll wrap up on a couple of things. You want to see if we got anything else to learn about them? Yeah. So you want to see collection bag? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we do. We can always use more of the collection bags, um, feed bags here. And then we do have some volunteers who have volunteered to sew handles onto them, but if that's something you are good at or you are interested in, let us know. Bring us more. <laughs> bags, bring us your sewing skills. Every year we need more and more, which is great. It's a good problem, good problem to have. So, and of course, some of our bags are wearing out. So. Most of them. Most of them are wearing out. <laughs> um, yes. And we did have a couple times where we were kind of maxed out on um, the amount of bags we were using in a single day. So, yeah. so you'll take bird seat bags. That's, yeah, that's perfect. Well, well just and an idea is maybe yeah. on your my impact site, maybe have a sewing circle come yeah. and attract people to bring their bird seat bags and their sewing skills. And like we've had a lot of these women and knitters and quilters seem to do this together. And I don't know, maybe do that. No, you're totally following in uh, Claire and I's training plot. We had a, a women's seed collection work day a few weeks ago and the totally good stuff. And some ladies there talked about that they like sewing. And they said, uh, so it may, and all three like to do this in the end. So, yeah, I don't have so that. And then I'll give you their pass. I S O W, I don't S E W. <laughs> yes, no, I'm not a good sewer writer, so I will just bring the food and talk. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, what else do we have up here? Oh, yeah, just another reminder if it's up here last time, but if you know anyone who's having issues using my impact, um, please just reach out to Claire or I or have them reach out to us. We're happy to go over it in person or over the phone or whatever if there's issues uh, arising. Um, I had a volunteer the other day express to me surprise that we weren't full up on work days, like at maxing out the amount of people. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, no, we, we can always do some work. So, yeah, please don't feel like if you you know, can't come for part of the time or you're worried about things being full or if something seems like it's full and it's not working correctly online, you can call up anyway because we're not having most of our work days fill up. So. It's pretty, I, what I appreciate is it really tells you if you can get it in. I mean, that's the first thing it says. You're, you're whatever, you know, you got space, so you're not signing up to get bumped out. The only year, once in a while, though, you got to go back and double check that you confirm that you signed up. Is that right? Or is that certain situations? Yeah, 
Um, it should just be a one click to sign up, but I think there has been cases where people like found a link to the event, but then you had to sign in as yourself and they weren't signed in. So you have to make sure like you are signed into your account yeah. before you go. No, that, yeah, it doesn't seem to work. Yeah. Uh, Yes, so let us know if there's any issues there. And if for whatever reason you can't get it to work, please just stop anyway. <laughs> I don't want you guys to not come. Okay. So. But your filters and your calendar, just your calendar works great. That's the easy way to find stuff. Awesome, good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. I like looking at it. So that's very good. Can you explain the reasoning behind the um, event email we got from Claire yesterday? Like, that like yeah planning events but I couldn't tell preserving the shelter of the event. it just it made me wonder like is there a special place well, I would have to go back and look at that okay. I just got back from vacation yesterday so I haven't seen everything that maybe has happened but um yeah I'll ask her about that I'm not, I'm not sure I, I think about. she meant for example um one of our board people owns the little Viking preschool in Mount Florida. Mm -hmm. And she wants to bring a bus of four-year-olds once a month to the to the park. Um, but I don't think she, they would need to reserve the shelter, but they just want to bring people to the park. I got the impression that that's the sort of event that Claire was talking about, that yet that she still wants to know if when you're coming with a group of people just to make sure everything's orderly or if you need an extra garbage barrel or something like that. Just because she said to avoid conflicts with other park users. So maybe it's hmm. something when a bunch of people up. come and then, but it's not. It's not an event that they can purchase aware of. Maybe if somebody calls in and they yeah. just want to know what's going on. So she, so she's like a group of kids coming that using and not reserving it. But she wants to know. So As many. She does, if she does reserve it to a bunch of college kids who want to have like a party, she knows that, well, hey, there's actually going to be kids. It says, as many of you know, anytime a friend's group or partner hosts a public event, in a Dane County Park, a special event permit must be submitted prior to the event. Yes. So, oh. so is that a special event permit? I keep reading a little bit there. Um, <laughs> say anything about there is no fee for this necessary and important step. It is through completion of this process that shelters are reserved. The event is added to our internal park operations calendar. And staff get the event site prepped and ready to go for your amazing event. Okay. This is how optional event resources such as the event trailer and things like additional picnic tables, trash cans are requested. Okay, so it sounds like she wants to classify even like probably this bus thing as an event. Right. Yeah, and then that's good to know. A special events permit, which I I, I don't I didn't know about yeah. that step, and I wonder. Right. Of course, this happened after we hosted St. Ambrose Academy, and it was like, uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> did I? Well, it could know. be because I think it, it, she sent that like the day after our board person said she okay. called Claire to find out what she had yeah. to do. So we were in the process of communicating a lot about now that there isn't that as there isn't a clean sign up process necessarily for a one-time event where kids are coming separate from their parents mm -hmm. like do we just assume can we assume as as hosts within the park that the parents are all have, have given consent for their children to participate in this event um, with the school chaperones they come on school transportation um, so we're just we're just recording numbers for the sake of giving feedback about participation. Mm -hmm. um, but is there some? Are there other things we need to do? Like, should I have put the St. Ambrose Academy thing somehow on a 
I guess I assume that since I was talking to Claire about the process as it relates to registration, she probably would have told you. That. She would have told me, but yeah. then, you know, the bathrooms had been closed for the season. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even the porta potty locked. So mm -hmm. I could have, I probably could have, I should have figured out that there is a way. There's an inter county communication system. Yes. Yeah, so I am used to just seeing the tail end of it where it's already been submitted, and then I go in and like reserve trailers and stuff for people. Uh, I know where it is, like online on our website, where you can like say you're going to have an event and put in a request form. I think the line gets a little confusing if it's like usually it's people who they need a trailer and they need specific tools or they need a shelter for specific reasons. If you just have a group out that's like going for a hike or doing something, you maybe don't need it, but then again, if you need the bathrooms to be open. So, yeah, I think yeah. it gets that's a little bit of a, a difficult line, and that would be clear as all where that okay. line is drawn, but all right, yeah. There's parts where it gets a little unclear, and I think there maybe was, I don't know specifically, but I'm guessing there was an issue with overlap or something. So. Question about, <clears throat> excuse me, 501c3. Um, why why would you do one? When when would you do one? And oh, yeah. I can, like, what he says, too small, I think, to have a friend's group. But I was thinking that um, because it's pretty close by and very similar landforms and, and what's being worked on uh, with lower month late, have a combined uh, friends group potentially. Um, haven't talked to Kathy about it, but I don't know why you would want to do one, I guess, when. So, one of the good reasons you can make one up if you got enough. For people to, to have talent to lead, dedicated to do it, you can get grants. Okay, that's the big thing. You can start matching, getting matching grants. You can get free grants. You can do signage. You can do all kinds of things if you're a, if you're under that category. It works a whole lot easier. The only requirement is you got to have certain forms. You got to have so many meetings a year and all that kind of stuff. Elected yeah. officers and stuff like that. So. But you get money. There's ways of getting money from lots of different institutions. Okay. Yeah. It's like Wabisa, at least, is just pretty much undeveloped hunting ground. So once we get it cleared, there's nothing more to do there. Right? <laughs> oh, there's always <laughs> more to do. <laughs> but like, you're not going to be putting in shelters. You're not going to be making paths. There's no signage. There's no trails. Or it's just
any more than that, um, you have to give them some sort of accommodation grants. Okay. Um, so that money is a big thing there, but it is it's a fair amount of work to have a you know, board officers have meetings, bylaws, sure. all your taxes, and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, there's there's an investment in time. Yet. Mm -hmm. so, okay. And there has to be carryover because you have to rotate people off the board. Mm -hmm. You know, so we kind of had like six people that were active and uh, five board positions <laughs> and <clears throat> people get upset and they leave. We never were, we haven't been able to establish a 501c3 at Stewart. Um, I blame Donald. <laughs> We're short of board people ourselves. Yeah. But, so but I just that, think that, but the rotate back to officers and board. So there's board and then there's officers, and you've got to rotate officers. Clearly, you don't have to rotate board members. Okay. So you, your rules, when you set up your rules, make sure you your minimal amount of officers, which is always at three, and and you got to have a treasurer type thing. But that does get to be an issue. Get people that don't like whatever you know, or can't or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I think all the more reasons for you to combine with them because yeah. that's what people are willing to do. look better on grants. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, okay. I think that'll be awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything wrong with it being stuck with these two grants. So they would, the uh, only thing we would require is that they just have to change their bylaws or whatever you want to, you know, but however they file with the state. And they, Another area. Yeah. Well, you have bylaws to agree that they're across different ownerships to different properties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, we're about out of time. Uh, yeah, right. you're out. So, of time. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.